Again, my name is Jim Southworth, S-O-U-T-H-W-O-R-T-H, and I am the National Transportation Safety Board investigator in charge assigned to investigate this accident. I work from our headquarters in Washington, D.C. I also have with me again Mr. Dick Hipskin and Georgetta Gregory on this team. Mr. Hipskin works from Valparaiso, or Indiana, and Georgetta Gregory is our Railroad Division Chief out of Washington as well. This is my third and will be my last press briefing while on scene. Once again, on behalf of the NTSB as an agency and myself and my team, we express our sincere condolences to the families, co-workers, and friends of the deceased in this accident. Last evening, NTSB investigators held another progress meeting to report and discuss their progress, findings of the activities, and as I said yesterday, this on-scene phase is just a fact-gathering that phase, and we continue to benefit from the parties cooperating and assisting us in this investigation. Those parties being the State of California, Public Utilities Commission, Bay Area Rapid Transit District, Federal Transit Administration, and the State of California, Department of Industrial Relations, Division of Occupational Safety and Health. Now, an update to include what we did today. Our on-scene examination of the signal system is complete. Preliminary calculations based on lengths of track segments were accomplished to help us ascertain train speed. This equipment, BART cars, do not have the type of event recorders that capture train speed. So we have to use other and additional data to get a good approximation of speed. This will help us with our sight distance and reenactment activity. Thorough mechanical inspections of the train set equipment have also been completed. The damage to the equipment has been documented. During this inspection, During this inspection and examination, flat spots on some of the rear car wheels was noted. Such flat spots may be the result of the application of brakes on the train prior to striking the two persons on the track. We have also requested 30 days of maintenance records for these rail cars, and BART is compiling that information for us as quickly as possible. We continue to receive additional documentation that we have requested from BART, California Public Utilities, and the FTA. The inspection of the equipment also verified that the lights, horn, and brakes were operable without any defects noted. We conducted additional extensive interviews with BART and California Public Utility employees and OSHA today. These interviews were conducted to obtain additional information relative to training provided to operators and to other employees that are authorized or approved to enter the right-of-way at or close to the tracks. We also gathered information regarding the relationship, regarding the oversight relationships that BART has with California Public Utilities, the Federal Transit Administration, and California OSHA. Like yesterday, this activity took the entire day to complete and we did gather a tremendous amount of information for us to examine. There were two individuals being trained to be operators on the day of the accident. Each trainee spent time in the operator's seat for such training under the direct supervision of an experienced trainer positioned behind the trainee. At the time of the accident, the trainee's time in the operator's seat was part of the trainee's certification to operate trains in revenue service. We have been told that the other employees on board were riding in the passenger portion of the car. In addition to the trainee operator and the supervisor trainer that have already been interviewed, we have plans to complete interviews with everyone that was on the train. Yesterday, there were a few questions related to what protection was provided to the two individuals that were out on the right-of-way and subsequently struck by the train. Prior to their entrance onto the tracks, the two persons requested and were granted simple approval from the control center. As part of the simple approval that the track inspector and the consultant received to allow them to go on or near the live tracks, the responsibility of their safety is on themselves. The inspector and consultant were required to remain together 
for the duration of their activity, and one of the pair is to be designated as the lookout. The lookout must be positioned outside of the train operating envelope to be able to view any oncoming train from either direction on any tracks. In this accident, there were two tracks. A job briefing is also required before beginning work. The designation of the lookout is determined during the job briefing and a plan is also discussed on how and where to move into the clear of any oncoming trains or other equipment operating on either track in either direction at any time. The examination of various downloads from the train equipment continues. The NTSB has taken custody of all image recording equipment on the train and the equipment has been shipped to our laboratory in Washington, D.C. This includes the data from an image and audio recorder in the operating cab portion of the lead car. The image recorders within the passenger portion of the car are being handled in the same fashion. Tomorrow, NTSB will also meet to plan and coordinate and develop protocols for sight distance and brake testing, akin to reenactment. This activity was pushed to tomorrow. The sight distance testing, brake testing, and reenactment will also occur tomorrow at the completion and agreement, or after the completion and agreement of plans and protocol tomorrow morning. As you're aware, BART began running revenue passengers trains early this morning. Additional interviews, as I mentioned before, will also be accomplished tomorrow. Some questions. She's asking, is one of the things that we'll investigate be, uh, uh, will we do things to determine how possibly the two people on track might have been caught off guard? Absolutely. We're looking at all of that and some of the image. Any preliminary information as to what the amount of the Now, as I said, uh, a lot of the recording equipment, video imaging, those types of things have been sent to uh, Washington. And once I have a chance to, to look at that stuff and, and do an evaluation, I might have more information relative to, to what was there. The question is, was simple approval granted to the, the, the persons on the track? Were the operators required to slow down? No, they were not. What time will the reenactment be tomorrow? Who will be involved in the reenactment? Typically, what the NTSB will do is try to do the reenactment and uh, sight distance testing at the same time the accident occurred. How long did the train operator at the accident bend in the seat and they change seats while the train is moving? No, not as it's moving, but as I said earlier, they both shared time in the seat. How long was this operator in the seat, you know, before impact? I'll probably be able to make a determination on that once I've seen and listened to all the video and image recordings. Are you looking into whether simple approval is an appropriate thing to be doing? His question is, are we looking in to see if simple approval is an appropriate thing to be doing? We're looking at all rules, all operating practices for what's done on BART and what's done in that area and what was done that day. So the answer is yes, we'll be looking at that as well. Was it, was it, was just a second. How long had BART known about the dip in the track? How long had, sir, question is, how long had BART known about the dip in the track? Uh, I don't know the exact answer to that at this time. Was the absence of newer technology a contributing factor to the accident? I'm not here to talk about contributing factors to the accident. That's the analysis portion of what we do with our report. I'm just gathering the facts. The emergency stop was pressed. Do you know who pressed the emergency stop where that came from? That is also information that I'll probably be able to confirm once I get a chance to look at the image recording, so I can't comment on that at this time. During the She's asking if during the simple approval process to the gentleman or the people on the track get any other radio transmissions or warnings. No, they do not. She there was a sound the wall there, uh, right by where the incident was, and that might have muffled the sound of that approaching train at the incident. Is that a factor you're taking into consideration? I missed the first part of your question. There is a sound wall right there where the incident occurred that could have muffled the sound of an approaching train. Is that a factor that you're looking into? Uh, no, I don't believe that's a factor. Is this a, should this have been a three-person job? Two people were out there. Should, should there have been a third person out there as a lookout? 
His question is, should there have been a third person out there as a lookout instead of the two? And that's another an analytical answer I, that I'm not prepared to give at this time. Were there were only two people out there. Were they on a Six people total in the cab. Were they on a track where they may not have expected a train to be coming in that particular direction? As I stated earlier, they expect, they're to expect the train in any direction, either track, at any time. The, she's, her question is about where is the location of the video recorders. There is a video, an audio recorder, that is there. Yeah. Her question was, where are the, where's the location of the video and audio recorders? There is a, there is a video, image recorder, audio recorder that is positioned to be able to capture the, uh, the cab operator cab section of the rail car. There are also cameras within the passenger portion of the car that I also have taken custody of. During your investigation out there, did it look like they were trying to get away and they just didn't have anywhere to go? Or what does it look like on the side of the train? Did they get out of the head like running? What did it look like? His question is about whether they, there was any indication at this time about whether they tried to get out of the way or, or avoid the collision. And that also is information I don't really have available to me now until I've had a chance to actually look at all the data, especially to include audio, video, rec video recording. Do you know that trains were threatened? What's the strike? Again, under simple approval, they're to be expecting trains on any either track, any direction, at any time. Was there a horn sound? Did they sound a horn as far as you know? Yes, there was a horn sounded. How long before? That I don't know at this time. It's a discussion that they have with the dispatcher to obtain that approval. Will the same people who were on the train at the time of the accident, will they be part of that reenactment? Her question is, will the same people that were on the train at the time of the accident, will they be part of the reenactment? No, they will not. Do the people being on the train, will they be the train to the the train in case of uh, a full-on large strike? As I said yesterday, the information I have directly was that they had two trainees on board that train, both to be qualified, certified as operators. Can you say outside of the envelope of the train, do you mean the lookout has to be outside of the profile of any part of the train? His question is, when I say that he has to be outside of the, the, the envelope of the, of, the, of the operating envelope of the train, what I mean by that, yes, he has to be completely off to the side, completely out of the clearance envelope where the train will operate on either track. One more question. What are you going to do with the information that you gather now? Who gets it and what will they do with it? Part of the process, we're here now doing the on-scene portion of the investigation. Fact gathering, just the facts. We will take that information, evaluate everything that we have, super -examinate everything, examine everything we have. We'll go through the transcripts of all the interviews that we've done and we'll start to develop a, a, a complete factual of the accident. At that time, we'll assemble with the parties again to review the factual data that we've put together to make sure nothing is missing, to make sure everything's clear, to make sure everything is accurate. At that point, then the NTSB by itself goes to work on developing the analysis for the report, which will also include supporting information for any recommendations that we might have to, uh, to, to prevent this from happening again, not just on BART, but on other transit agencies across the country. Ultimately, when the report's finished by staff, it's presented to the National Transportation Safety Board, five members, a chairman, a vice chairman, and three others that are all appointed by the president for a review of the report and acceptance of the recommendations. That's done at the very end of the, uh, of the process. Thanks very much. What's your timeline for this? Do you have uh, some sort of preliminary Pardon me? What's your, what's your timeline of doing that preliminary report? The development of these reports, the development of the final report can take anywhere from six months to a year, maybe longer, dependent upon the data that we've collected and the amount of time it takes to appropriately go through that data. Thank you.